I think he's Canadian. It's, there, it's being recorded, apparently. So if you don't want to see your image on the screen, then it's fair enough. Um, now, two, not last week, but two weeks ago, we were looking at the the wonderful early medieval period, the period of illumination, the period of enlightenment, not the Dark Ages. Now, what I wanted to do was to try and illuminate this period that we that we're struggling to know more about in regards to um, the late 400s all the way to the period of the Normans into the late 10 hundreds. And I know the, the, the dates are vague there because the whole thing is very vague. Now, to actually try and get to grip with this new period, I thought it was appropriate to go Scotland way. And it takes us out of our comfort zone. It takes me out of my comfort zone, but not really because I do love Pictish stones. And that's exactly what we're going to look at now. Now, a place, the place that I, will, I know very, very well is Orkney and if, you know, if you've been with me for some time, you will know that I I do like to dabble up to Orkney occasionally, and this is one of those dabbler days. But before we actually get to a dabbler day, let's look at this nice little image. Now, this is one side of a um, dress stone and an inscribed stone. Now, Carl, Carl you've still got your. A little logo up there saying this meeting is being recorded. It's in the middle of the screen. It's in the middle of the screen. It does it go? Mine did. I just clicked on it and it disappeared. Well, that, that's because you're special. Apparently, you've got to click on it, um, Keith, and it disappears. No, it doesn't. Well, oh, well, uh, oh, yes, it does. Continue. Continue. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Are you, you're okay with that? Yep. Yep. It's gone. Oh. So I tell you what, I, there are people who attend my classes who've got special needs and those who've got an enhanced special needs. And you're definitely one, Keith. So, oh. That woman turns up every week like she's doing. Are you charging a subscription? Who? That American woman. Is she paying subs? <laughs> How dare you? Now, stop a minute, right? How dare you even suggest that I'm not charging her money? You know what I'm like. Well, that's all right, then. For God's sake, I tell you what, right? Somebody's going to say, get on with it in a minute. We're taking long enough to start as it is. Right. Okay. Deep breath. Now, when we look at inscribed stones in a Pictish context. The fox in the coop. There's no fox. There's no fox in the. Oh, for God's sake. I'll put him away then. God's sake. This is driving me at the freaking wall. <laughs> It just adds to how eccentric he is, really, isn't it? Here <laughs> in the background. <laughs> I'm going to get in touch with the RSPCA. That's mistreatment of chickens. And the turkey. And the turkey. Yeah. And the goats. And the two little baby, and the two little baby ducks he has. See, I, I, I've sort, I've sorted the chickens now. Oh, good. Uh, uh, can we get on with it? Oh, yes, <laughs> we, we can get on with it. Yes. Ah, oh, deep breath. Right. I was attempting to try and say that we're looking at the meaning of Pictish stones, and lots of the carved Pictish stones seem to lead us through a nice chronology of fascinating changes in regards to a culture in Scotland that for the rest of the British Isles is hitherto um, very much inaccessible in regards to what the picks mean. Now, this, this one stone itself is one of very few stones that have actually been found on Orkney. Now, what we do find in regards to Pictish stones, which seem to be carved from about the 300s all the way into about the 900s and beyond. So a period of well over 500 years, they're actually inscribing in these stones. 
Um, and what we inevitably find is, is, is very graphic descriptions of their life carved into the stone and lots of um, symbolism imbued with, with, with deep characteristic meaning for the pics. And then sometime around the mid 600s, well, a bit before actually in some cases, we actually see the, um, the, inter the imposing of Christianity onto the Pictish world. When I use the word imposing of Christianity onto the Pictish world, in many ways, the Picts seem to guide towards Christianity quite, quite easily. And um, what happens is the art that they've been using and they've been inscribing in stones for generations um, is interposed with Christian symbolism and then slowly but surely Christianity has the upper hand and you just got you just have the Christian cross and sort of Christian symbolism but cheekily what we do actually find on later picture stones is that even though they might have Christian symbolism on one side of the stone they, they cheekily put their old Pictish symbolisms on the reverse of the stone now it would be it would be very inappropriate of me to look at all different Pictish stones in Scotland, because what I'm trying to put across is that we've got we've got a different time and we've got a different um, sense of place. And that time and a different sense of place links us to link, links them to us, for example, in Wales and Cornwall and everywhere else. So. This this one stone found in 2015 in Orkney um, is a stone that we'll we'll look at and we'll we'll address and see what this stone means. Um, and this was found as 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 part of an erosion event along the um, the islands of um, Orkney because lots of things around Orkney are eroding into the sea, as one or two of you that will know uh, when you've actually been to. Um, Orkney with me and I do know that some of the images that we see today are images that we may have seen in press releases images that we've seen um, in other contexts over the past few years but I just wanted to bring them to you to actually install a different sense of meaning now what we do know about the pics is that there's there's a lot of information out there but very similar to what we have uh, in Wales is that is trying to put all that information together to really understand what was going on. Now, the first stone that we're going to look at was found in that locality up there with the red dot near Elgin. Now, Elgin itself in Scotland, near Inverness, above Aberdeen, in, in a very interesting landscape overlooking the Moray Firth, they found this stone. Now, this is a very, very unusual stone in, in the way that the headlines portray how this was found. It was found, it was found in February 2019. It was reported on the 26th of February in 2019 by the very eminent Scottish publication, The Scotsman. So if you ever go to Scotland, go to Edinburgh, get a copy of The Scotsman. It's, it's full of sort of wonderful things. This stone itself, the stone that you can actually see in front of you, and I'm hoping it's um Yes, it, it's, it's the right way up for all of us. This stone itself is, is an amazing six foot in length. And the headlines, Pictish stone discovered in the north of Scotland. Now, we're not going to use the usual characteristic sentence that I, using lots of my lectures, this is the most important find ever made in the history of archaeology. Ever. Ever. Oh, sorry, forgot to put that in there. The, the, the thing is about this is that at least one important picture stone seems to be found every year now. And, and in a way, all of these stones are actually painting that very important sense of, um, of origins to the Scottish people. So discovered in the north of Scotland, a new picture stone. This was actually found on a building site. But guess who found it? A metal detect enthusiast. Now, the metal detect enthusiast was was wandering a, a, a wandering on a um, a development site, probably not meant to be there. He sounds a bit like me. He was wandering on a development site, and he was there with his old metal detector. And he looked over in the corner, and there was this stone, lying lying flat. This stone, and he and he looked at it, and and it was actually some carvings on it. Amazingly enough, there were some carvings on it. You can actually tell 
from the white marks on it where the JCB has picked that up and sort of is, is tossed it around a tiny bit of residual damage on the stone. And this again was found by complete accident. Now, it could have been lost. It, it was it was um, it was associated with a business park. It may have been broken up. Um, and if this was actually found in heavy clays, all of the surface um, incisions on the um, sandstone rock would not be visible. And we will see that from from another stone coming up as well. Uh, I, I was um, I made the I made a classic mistake when I was talking about it um, on Tuesday. And um, because I was looking at a stone and I wasn't seeing anything on the image. And actually, when I cleaned it up and had gotten all the incised grooves on it, we, we could actually actually see a wonderful design. So, again, you've got this beautiful representation of eagle. You've got what was what's called a Z-rod design. Now, what we do see, you see a Z-rod. Uh, as you follow the cursor, it goes down and it goes up and it goes down again. Now, also, that could be indicated as some kind of hair clip. Um, I know it sounds as ridiculous as it sounds, and that is actually an eagle. Now, if you if you squint your eyes and you might be into a, able to interpret this, this these these could be said to be cartouches, as in the word cartouche in regards to the hieroglyphic in connection with leaders and important people in ancient Egypt. But this is this is thousands of miles away, and it's thousands of years difference in history that these are actually found in the archaeology. However, they might be imbued with the same meaning that we might be able to interpret the symbols individually from each stone and each territory has these has these symbols on them. Now, the other thing is, uh, well, that we do find with these stones is something very similar in, in regards to our own land, Cymru, Wales, is that we actually see Ogham script. Now, what we do find on Pictish stones is also Ogham script. It's those tiny little lines that come up to characters and so on. That that's that's the the Ogham script that we actually find on these stones. So we've we've got the Ogham lang language being written down, the, the the written form being written down in in, a, in at least two <coughs> parts of the British Isles, uh, Cymru, Wales, and Scotland. But the symbolism on the stones is very very different from any any type of symbolism that you might find in our wonderful fair land. Now, what we don't have is a full understanding of what the symbolisms on these stones actually mean, which is very, very unfortunate. But going back to the head, headlines of this article, the stone is, is, almost, is almost two uh, metres in length, just, just under two metres, it's six foot tall, and estimated to weigh at least two ton, tons. Lots of these stones can be seen to be carved into sandstone, and it's sometimes believed that lots of these stones are in pairs, so there might be another one wandering around. What do they mean? Now, obviously, we've got the, the, the notched uh, rectangular design there and, and the Z-rod and, and an eagle. And the archaeologist that was, uh, the archaeologist saw this stone says, this is potentially very exciting. It is potentially a um, specific style of Pictish stone to that area, but it does need verification. Now, th this find is very, very new within the context of archaeology and research. And there are naturally lots of similarities. And what we might find is that this stone might be actually carved by, by the same stonemason that may have been responsible for carving other stones that we, we know about. So having having that sort of um the major significance and in these headlines the the other thing that i i might occasionally say is this is a once in a lifetime discovery by the archaeologists that actually found it so if you're finding one a year and there's there's a thousand archaeologists working in scotland you can imagine that you know it's going to be very rare for any archaeologist to actually be involved in discovering one of these now one thing that one thing that i'm one thing that I am going to mention quite early on is two things. It's quite likely that even though the imagery on there looks quite stunning, it might be that it, in, in, in many indications that these, these were actually all painted. So 
the contrast, whether they were painted with all different colors or whether there was just one color and you could you could understand that there was a sense of shadows and a sense of um, a, a meaning and viewed by the color and so on. But this is what we think that they were actually colored. And when we, we, we get the idea that they were actually colored and we don't have massive in, interpretations of scientific um, analysis on the on the stones at the minute. But because lots of Pictish um, metalwork and um, other uh, uh, Pictish pottery and so on is 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 richly decorated, we, we do believe that their pottery was richly decorated as well. Another thing that we we have to massively say with this, and you know, I'm always beating the drum about heritage and that we do a really bad job of of conserving and preserving our heritage in in Cumbria, Wales. In Scotland, they have a different approach to this type of monument. One, that they're all protected. Two, that the Pictish stones that have been discovered, the ones that are in museums, in pride of place, very near the locality that they were found. Um, others have really nice um, stout fences around them. And the most spectacular ones are not taken to museums. They've got huge glass cabinets erected around them. So, you know, usually, um, as in this court in front of me, I will read it out. I've only ever seen things like this in a museum, and it is a mysterious thing. Being being dug up on a building site to to being something that could have been easily discarded is is something that makes us happy to think that something like this has actually been um, retained because it was so big. I, I think I think the JCB bucket thought, well, you know, this is just too much to break up. We need to just chuck it to the side of the field. And that's exactly the way it was actually found. You never know when you might actually turn up with anything like this. Um, and it's it's the same with with any sense of archaeology, where archaeology is usually found by by complete accident. So that just said about that one find very, very, really relatively new find. So we're, we're only going back to um, headlines in, in February of the 26th in 2019. So it's two years ago that this is, this is found more or less. Um, and, um, or one year ago, if you want to um, ignore that we had the uh, pandemic. So, so the fact of the matter is, again, new things like this are being found. M mind you, mind you when, when you think about the context of Scotland, you, you think, well, you know, in Scotland, you can find a whole Pictish uh, banked and ditched hill fort enclosure type things, which which uh, the banks are really clear and the ditches are really clear and so on. Um, and you think, well, if that type of thing could be found under two meter stone is 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 like a finding a pin in a haystack. But but these these things are being found and it might be associated with um, it might the, the people that made this stone maybe sometime in about the 600s may have been the people later on that, that um, turned to Christianity and were involved in the building of this beautiful cathedral Elgin many hundreds of years later. So the word Elgin, that, that might sort of spur up why you might know the name Elgin in Scotland. But just one last thing as well is what we do find as well, which, which, is, which is an interesting point, what we do find is that we can think of these stones as being um, uh, recumbent. They're, 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 they're sort of um, on their side, they're, 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 they're flat because they've collapsed. Because what you do find is that you've, um, I've got to write something down there. What you do find is that all that's in the ground is this small section here. And you can imagine if these is like positioned in the ground and there's loads of stones around it and one of the stones is missing and then then the stone falls over. And again, the big reason, just like the one behind me, the big reason why lots of these are really preserved is down to the point of fact is that they're they're only slightly being secured in the ground. So it doesn't take much for these to fall over. And when they do fall over, they're they're either face down in the dirt and if they're face down in the dirt, then then that's going to be protected from erosion and that's going to be there for a very, very long time. So let's sort of move on a bit. And it has it has quieted down in the background. So I don't have um, I don't have the chickens making noises. That's unlike you, um, Goff, to make 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 a comment about my chickens. Well, so they've been one was being strangled. 
<laughs> well, they're always being strangled, love. They, they, you know, it's, it's, it, it, they, 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 they're strangled with our love. No, we well, wouldn't. Hurt, we wouldn't hurt any of our chickens. No, but a fox might. No, why would we have foxes in the valleys? Do you know what I mean? You nobody sees any foxes anymore. Anyway, so the next stone that we're going to actually look at is is another relatively new discovery. And what I'd like to do, I'd like to get the, I'd like to get my little, um, I'd like, I'd like to get my little writing board out, which I don't actually um, use in regards to um, the these online things. We're going to try that today. And um, that there is relatively new coming out of the ground. That's really, really new. That's, that's only been out of the ground for about two years. And you see that there? You can see nothing on it? Well, that's where some of the some really nice carving is actually to be found. But we're going to leave that image there for a moment. And what I'm going to do to actually learn a, a little bit more about these stones and to sort of try and put them into the classification that I've made very, very simple. If you ever go to Scotland and sort of... Um, try to sort of understand these stones and it's a bit mixed the way uh, that, that we, we can actually look at these. So what I'm going to do, we're going to have a little bit of a whiteboard. Oh, it's great, isn't it? Excellent. So if, if we if we think of, and here we go, this is my drawing skills now, right? There, there, there we go. There, there is, doesn't that look good? And what we'll do, we'll put a bit, bit of grass there, a couple of blades of grass. Doesn't that look good? Yeah. Is that Beautiful. good, Keith? Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, and, and yeah, thanks, Keith. And then, 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 then we then we've got another stone, right, which is over here. A bit of grass there, right? Make make it look really realistic, right? Do you know what that? You know, happy doing the grass there. And what what you have? You have a, a very crude um, looking mirror, right? And you might have um, something known as a Z rod, and usually you might have like a bit of a fleur de, fleur -de lis de design on the on the edges, right? You know, Goff is so so he wants Goff wants wants me to decorate his new house, so that that sort of that's you could say that that's type one stone, that's sort of type two stone, and then what you might have is a type three stone, right, which is a little bit better dressed. Right. And, it, you know, it's not as rough as the other one, uh, a bit more grass. And what, what you then find is Christianity coming in. So you've got this this really interesting cross, um, really chunky cross. Right. Um, on the stone. And this this is sort of the period of Christianity. And what you might see is sort of um, um, serpent designs on them. So they might go down like that and you might have a bit of head. Um, do you know what we could do is Rolf Ferris at this point maybe could help us out. Um, and you might you might have like weird designs on the 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 Christian stone, so that's sort of part three. And then you've got later stone. Oh God, that didn't go well of you. That that's just a line, by the way. Um, and then <laughs> sure. Uh, then then you have really well dressed stones, okay? And then it goes there. Really. Oh, hang on, that's wrong, isn't it? Oh God. Have you guessed what it is yet? And then, then you have that stone there, and, and that, that's really pride of place. And what, what you then find is a, is a really nice Christian cross on there, and we will, we'll, we'll go overboard with this nice Christian design, right? And we'll sort of put that there, and uh, we'll put that there, um, and we'll, we'll have a nice little bit. Of, well, well, go on. There, there you go. Down, down there. And oh, look at that. That's great, isn't it? Keith, this is so working out so well, isn't it? That's beautiful. It, it is, it, Keith. I'm glad. Yeah. I'll, I'll save this to you and I'll send it to you right afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. I know you appreciate everything I do. I, I know what will happen is that Algernon will criticise it. So wonderful cross there, right? And that that's going to be that's going to be say. Um, uh, the grass on it, by the way. You've left out the grass. All right, all right, okay. Now I've written the bloody wrong number down. Oh, for God's sake, what a numpty. Right, okay, I'll put the I'll put a number four there, right? And for him, right, we'll put the grass on there, right? Yeah, okay. That's better, that's a lot better. Oh, oh, God's sake. Right, and there's the grass, right? Now, the grass is green. What's that? I know the grass is green. This is red grass, okay? This is Lord of the... This is... This is what, what's the one um, War of the Worlds where the grass starts going green? Okay, fine. Planks. Now 
what what when you think about when you think about this you you would you would think that um plain stones may actually be from an earlier context so going all the way up into about the two three hundreds and then what you start to see is is this sort of pictish phase of art which is number two which is like the three three hundred four hundred five hundred something like that and the stones are inevitably rough they're sort of class one type stones right and then what you have is you've got sort of class one stroke class two stones where things that look a bit more organized but what you do have is christianity is coming along this is when you get christianity in in the late um 500 600 so christianity is sort of within the consciousness of the pick so that's number three and what happens is that you you do find that even though you've got this period of christianity what you do find is that you've got christianity and what I need is a is a pointer. What you've got is Christianity, right, with their Christian symbolisms and and the sense of the Pictish world all intertwined together. So what you would find is, you know, late 500, 600, sort of 700, somewhere like that. You, what you do find is that these stones themselves have Christianity and all the sort of Pictish, pagan, all that stuff together. You know, it's all together. But coming in a little, a little bit later, by at least the 10 hundreds, what you do see is that is that the real sense of Christianity has really taken over, where you've got Christian symbolism and you might have angels on them and um, and you won't have any of this weird sort of serpent stuff. But the Pictish carvers always had their last word. What they would do on the reverse of the stone, they might put some Pictish symbolism anyway. They might say, hey, hey guys, right, look at this beautiful stone. But by the way, on the back, I put this beautiful serpent and there's, there's this there's this sort of guy hunting this pig on the back and and so on and so on. So the picks, the, the sense of the Pictish world never, ever died. It, it continued in. It continued on. And maybe what did survive of the Pictish world is something that me and Kathy have sort of uh, had a great deal of intercourse with when we look at the stone in Kirkwall Cathedral when we're looking at those stones and we're discussing those stones in Kirkwall Cathedral, beautifully dressed stones and all the rest of it. And that sense of carving on those stones in Kirkwall Cathedral maybe comes back, goes all back generations after generations, all the way to the times that the, those picks would actually be carving into the stones. And the stones that you do see in the likes of Kirkwall Cathedral are sandstones that are the same types of stones that would have been the stone that would have, the picks would have used in the first place. So, so the picks never ever went away. It's just that they they didn't manage to get away with doing these serpents on the stones and all the rest of it for the hundreds and hundreds of years that we get into into the medieval period and actually belong. So there you go. What we're going to do? We're going to say goodbye to this image. Um, I, I'm glad you've enjoyed looking at that image oh, today. Oh, that's nice. It is nice, isn't it? It's it's almost yeah. as if Tony Hart. Tony Hart. All right then. Okay, fair enough. Tony Art. Wasn't he from Cardiff? Yeah, yeah Splot, actually, or Splow, I should say. Splow. He's, you're going to probably tell me he actually was now. Anyway, I've forgotten what we're blooming doing. Now, anyway, the picks, the pick stone. Now, now the one thing one thing about these stones is that um, this this makes me think of the likes of Yolomar Gonog and Edward Williams, when we look at Lantwick Major Church Graveyard. Now, we're told in the late 1700s, Yolomar Gonog was wandering along and he, he found a beautiful inscribed stone with the inscription actually face down, going over the little Ogby book there by the church. And, and it was used as a, um, a little footbridge. And, and nobody knew what was on that stone until it was turned around. This stone itself is a bit strange because the actual carvings are there. They're there, but you need to clean it up to actually see the carvings. Now, this this is why this is so important. And the other thing as well is people people had been wandering along around this church graveyard for generation after generation. And if we if we think about if we think about the the images that we've actually just put up on the screen, oh they're gone. Oh no, God, I've lost them. Oh, they're still there. See, can't get rid of them. What we what we might see, interestingly enough, that there's a there's another little phase that I have actually put in here, right? The phase is is that for whatever reason, why have I just done that? Hang on a minute, let's just get rid of that, right? What for whatever reason there may have been a sense, there may have been a period when as Christianity's developing, maybe the places of Christianity have moved. So the stone may have been abandoned, 
right and may have ended up lost in the church graveyard so somebody else comes along and they they find a new stone and they inscribe this this new stone over here however what we do find with some examples is that for a long period of time as christianity develops again there's a great period where these stones are just lying outside and suddenly they might collapse and they might be lying flat on the ground so there we go keith just sort of get this sort of there on the ground now you've got a blue stone um from wales in scotland no, i'm only joking this stone itself right and to really make this look artistic right and this is going to impress you all right if we do little bits of grass growing right it gets lost in the grass there you go see it gets lost in the grass for generation after generation right you've got green grass this time right and then what might happen in the case of the one that we've got behind me is that they might find this stone and re-erect it and they might put inscriptions on it and guess what the stone falls down again only to be the stone behind me and the stone in front of you to be rediscovered and that's where we're going to go next oh god i don't i don't have labor the point don't i flip a neck so anyway so what 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 we've got is that looking at this stone here and there it is now interesting enough there is actually very fine inscriptions on that stone. Can you see them? No, you can't because the surface is embedded with clay, really thick clay in all those little grooves in all those in the size marks on the stone. There's clay. So you can't actually see any of the designs. Now, this stone itself, I don't have the original image, but what you can see the giveaway that people have been walking on this for ages and knowing it's there and not actually knowing what the stone was about is actually to be seen in this that's actually lichen growing so that must mean that at least part of the stone had actually been showing on the surface for some time but everyone had ignored it because it was in a church graveyard an old church graveyard and because it was in an old church graveyard when everybody thought look it's just a an old gravestone let's leave it there let's just do nothing with it let's just continue to cut the grass um, and the archaeologists come along and actually, they actually thought that there's something really interesting about this stone. It's a big, thick stone. It, mm. it might be, it might be something important. So they did work out that this was very important. And it's a discovery. It, it's a rediscovery of something that's always been around. Yeah. So it's a bit like, it, it's a bit like wandering the lanes of Lantwit Major as, as I do occasionally with um, Keith. We wander the lanes of uh, Lantwit Major and there's stones that we might pass and we don't think anything of them. But if you have a little bit of an examination, you might actually find some detail that somebody may have missed. Very similar to some carvings that have actually been found in Scotland in the last week. There's a, a, there's a Neolithic uh, um, chamber of some description and they found 5,000 year old carvings on the underside of the capstone um deers um not old deers but deers on this stone which are old by the way um and this woman's gone in there and just sort of um was laying on her back and she looked up at the ceiling with a torch um and then she she saw that there was designs on the stone they had been there for thousands of years and nobody knew they were there so it's about looking and inter interpreting sometimes archaeology that's in front of you and you it's like it's like the, that elephant in the room. You you don't know it's there. You you um, it's a bit it's a bit like it's a bit like we've had a we've had a um, a tube of Pringles in the cupboard for two months, and every time somebody goes in that cupboard, the 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 packet of sealed Pringles is in there, and nobody has and nobody has ever noticed it, right? Um, and it's it's that type of aspect that something might be in front of you, and you've just ignored it. So. Uh, Michelle's quickly going to the cupboard to try and find it as well. Um, so let, let's have a let's have a nice look at this. Um, let's have a nice look at this image. And there you can see you can see some nice um, Pictish knotwork. The Pictish knotwork is is very different to any knotwork that you might find in regards to Cornwall or Ireland or Brittany or Cymru Wales. Um, it's 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 rectilinear knot work and it's it's sort of the, the knot the circular um knot work that you do find is very different as well so you can imagine right 
that guy has actually got his hand on some beautiful carvings, which you just cannot see. And that is the beautiful carvings. Now, how can, how can you not have seen them? Because that's that over in the, that over in the, um, hang on, let me get my little cursor up there. I don't know. Da, 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 da. Uh, if we, that, that there is where the lichen was growing on, on the previous slide. And do you know what, when I, when I was actually, when, when I was looking at this on Tuesday, I actually said this was on the underside. And then I realized towards the end of the lecture that I was completely wrong because we, we know that this, you can see that there. So that there, if we clear all the drawings and we, we go back a minute is actually what that is there. And you can see the tapering there which is the same tapering that you can actually see at the bottom. So this design itself was lying for all to see. And guess what? Back to what I said earlier on, you've got some wonderful, you've got some carving on there from 1796. Now that is really, really interesting because back to what I said, the, the stone itself must have been standing a thousand four hundred years ago. Um, and you don't, see it imbued with Christianity on this face when it was originally carved. Um, and then whatever happened, the stone probably collapsed. And then what happened on the reverse side, they actually carved a Christian cross and it was re-erected again with the Christian cross showing out. And then the stone must have collapsed down must have been lying in the long grass for a while. And somebody said, hang on a minute, mate. That, that's going to be a good grave marker, that is. That's going to be a good grave marker for Hugh. So what they then is re-erected that stone. And lo and behold, the stone collapsed again. And the, the, one, the, one, thing, the one thing that I must say, and thank you very much. The, the, one, the one thing that I must say is that... You, you, you only find stones um, in this level of preservation if they may have at some time, because of the type of sandstone um, that's there, they, must, they, they couldn't have been always erect because the design would have quickly eroded off them. And if you can see, this is a type of sandstone that flakes. So all that design would have been lost. So it, it's, it's very likely what we're looking at as a stone that hasn't, through its entire life, always been continually standing up in the open. And they may, may have actually been deliberately placed flat over periods of time in its history as well. So it's 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 a bit like those, um, it's a bit like that sense of those those stones that we can sort of eke and understand um, when we look at the stones at Stonehenge, stones that have been continually moved around with. That's one thing that I will agree with when people analyze Stonehenge is that the stones at Stonehenge have been moved around. They've been put in holes and they've been taken out of holes and they've been moved again and they've been taken out of holes and moved around. That's part of the process. So this stone itself is, is actually being found in a place in Scotland known as Dingwall. Um, and if we, if we just go back again and we just say, there is Dingwall just south of Foolis Castle in the middle, um, in, the, in the Black Isle. So D Dingwall, the one in the middle. We go back again there it is and uh, let's just sort of a little little bit more of the text this this obviously the, the carving on the one side dates to um you know the christian cross itself dates to around 1200 years ago 1100 years ago and we know of we know of at least 50 complete pictish cross slabs like this there there, there are a number of others um that are semi-complete within museums and, and littering the Scottish landscape, decorated with earlier symbols. And then later on, you see Christian symbolism on the stone itself. And uh, this again is associated with a much earlier church site. It was used as a grave marker, as we know, in 1796 and discovered hidden in vegetation by, by the archeologist Anne McInnes in 2019. But but when you think about it, it couldn't have been that hidden because there was like the fern, uh, there was the ferns growing on it. 
So the, the, the picks, to give you a little bit more detail about what's going on, the picks created cross slabs, intricately decorated standing stones. They also, um, as we know, constructed many other fascinating um, sites, such as the defended, defended um, hill fort site. So archaeologists believe the newly found stone would have originally measured more than two meters in height. The one that you can see today is just only over a meter in height. So there's a there's there's another bit of the stone stone somewhere else in the graveyard. So it's decorated with a number of pictures designs. So if we go to the image as I'm discussing this, and again, spot them all. Let's 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 just sort of um, do this. So if we move there, so what we can see is uh, mythical beasts in the bottom left hand corner. There is an oxen and an animal headed warrior. So you've got an animal headed warrior with um, a shield and a sword. Um, I'm, I'm struggling to find out where the oxen. Oh, yeah, the oxen is down in, in the bottom corner. There's the oxen. He's down there in the bottom. This almost looks like a, a tiger type beast. So you've obviously got the shield, the very small shield and the sword as well. You've got lots of mythical beasts as well. The seahorse as well, but the heat seahorse is not a mythical beast. It's to be seen swimming in the seas in the south of England. So, um, and you've got the double disc and the Z rod, a Z rod. The, the, the Z rod is something that you might see in regards to lots of these Pictish stones across Scotland. Experts said the carvings appear to have more in common with Pictish stones found in Persia than those previously found um, anywhere else. So, you know, you've got stones that, that have different meanings and a different way of interpreting them. And guess what, um, Goff? A second stone, the archaeologist quoted. This is a once in a lifetime find, the most important find ever. Not the last sentence he didn't say. Details of the carving on the reverse side um, what, what, what we're doing uh, on both sides is, is really trying to interpret what's going on. And the archaeologist, uh, Miss McInnes, she was saying, I was clearing vegetation when I spotted the carving. I really couldn't believe what I was seeing. And, and that's the thing. And this itself is being examined. And this is being placed on display in um, a, the Highlands Museum or a very more suitable venue. And the discovery of the top half of a large um, cross slab with picture symbols is of national importance um, or, or part of a, um, a, a large um, slab. So the, the fine spot itself is associated with an earlier Christian site. So we, we're thinking, well, we, we've been talking about earlier Christian sites with, with some of the other lectures that we've been doing and thinking, well, what is early Christianity about? This, this is the question I keep asking. What is early Christianity about? Is it just about churches? Or as I think, it's more about places of worship. It's more about um, standing stones like this. It's, it's more about preaching this new sense of religion to the people rather than in buildings themselves. So this is why we, we see an absence of monasteries throughout the early medieval period and early churches because they probably may not have existed. People may have just preached from set localities, as with the idea of the um, sense of the early uh, preaching uh, cross plinth that I actually uh, mention at localities. I, I say about the plinth that before the church is built, the plinth is a place that people would, would worship. So if you're trying to find an early church, you're not going to find one because all there was was this plinth. And this is a really important, this is a really important area that archaeology goes into. We've actually got loads of these inscribed stones with senses of early Christianity on them. Um, and the question should be asked that maybe this is all that there was of early Christianity. A few monastic sites and cells in places, but the places that people would access would be these localities and they would listen to they would listen to Latin being read out to them that they didn't really understand. They would they would have people um, who who would be um, christened, baptized? Um, they they would have people um, that would form, perform marriages at these localities, not necessarily having a building, which is a really important point. And that the important point about that is is that before these stones become inscribed with Christian symbolism, they were inscribed with Pictish symbolism, which was not nothing to do with Christianity. 
and nobody's talking about where are the Pictish places of worship? Did they have churches? Did they have temples? Did they have this and that? Nobody's discussing that question. They're just saying that they had these stones. Well, why couldn't have Christianity just have had these stones um, for the new faith to be um, broadcast from? Again, all of these are a once in a lifetime find for any archaeologist. And as archaeology goes, the importance of the stone and putting plans in place for, for the future of these stones um, helps understand the history of what's going on within the landscape of the Picts a hell of a lot more than we hitherto had known 10 years ago. And what, what I was saying earlier on about um, this, this sort of corner in here as well, and again, you know, I didn't want to do all 50 stones. I just wanted to do one or two like this. Can you see that that sort of really nice sort of angular knot work, which is over in the right there? That that is that is very different from anything that we'd see in the rest of Britain. We might see something like that associated with the Book of Kells, where you've got the 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 angular knot work rather than the um, rather than the the sense of um, the geometric circle that you can actually see elsewhere on this design. But even even the knot work here is very different from anywhere else in the British Isles. So the the picks were very unique and, and very different from from the different peoples and again what these what these people wanted to do th these people were very much were very much pre-christian and christian before christianity um and what i mean by that is quite simple christianity if you see these stones as as i'm indicating as being the only places of worship the only place to access christianity because they wouldn't have been given out gideon bibles for example there would be one holy man with a with a bit of a holy book or a little missile, and that's all the person would have. Uh, um, and a donkey with panniers on it, and that that would be the way Christianity made its way through Scotland and the rest of the British Isles. This is what these important standing stones are about. Those are the places of worship. No more, nothing less. That's where everything. This is a bit like the the idea of the yew tree as well. I'm going off on a massive tangent, by the way, here. But what we what we do see those that know my know the way I describe um, know, know the way I describe um, Christian paintings in churches. We went to Lancarven, did we not? When we went to Lancarven, I basically said, you've got that picture. Uh, this, this, the, the, this is telling you about the deadly sins and it, it, there was very little writing associated with that and it's just telling a story, right? In, in that vein, if Christianity is telling a story through images and inscribed stones and paintings and all the rest of it, why couldn't the Picts have done the same thing? It, it, they're telling their own story about their own culture before Christianity. And when Christianity comes along, they say, we've already been doing this, boys and girls. Let's just put a cross on it and we'll continue telling our story. Brilliant. So in many ways, this is Christianity and the Picts really sort of had this really deep intercourse and that intercourse lasted and and it became an amalgam of those those two beings the, those two senses of identity and this is why christianity and the early uh, pictish ideal of symbolism and what they're about really really worked it's a bit like what christianity is all over christianity christianity is roman it, it's that sense of pax romana you um you, you offer Christianity and somebody says, oh, by the way, we've got Christmas trees. We'll have a bit of that. Or oh, by the way, we've got Saturnalia. Oh, I tell you what, we'll have a bit of that. We'll make it the 25th uh, when Jesus Christ was born, you know, or upon us. Oh, that's a good one. What we'll do, we'll 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 take the idea of the stable. We'll chuck the horse out into the cold and that will be a pona from the um, religion of England in the sense of Mary Lloyd. And all these things start to come in. This is what Christianity is about. Christianity is a locust. It, 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 it consumes and it brings it into its own sense of being an awakeness and its own wokeness, that new word that we use, our own wokeness, our own new way of inventing things. Um, and this is this is what we're actually seeing in, imbued in all this all this wonderful carving. Um, and again, if we again look at this now, this even you, you can see. Can you not see what I've been talking about? This this is this is on the reverse of that very stone that you can see behind me. This is the same stone. This is the flat side. And can you see what you've got? You've got that. You've got Christianity. 
and you've got this wonderful knot work and you've got these this sort of a little serpent there in the left hand corner yeah and you've got these two these two dragon beastly like heads what's this doing on the stone but in other words in many ways you can see that the the picks seem to be protecting this new sense of identity the picks were carving these stones no one else it were they were carving these stones so in other words they they they're putting their arms around christianity and saying what we will do we will we will we will carve into this stone this cross but we're going to put our beasts and we're going to put our symbolism around it we're going to protect it we're going to keep it very safe and in many ways um um, when you look at something like Bath and the Roman period, Aqua um, Sulis, when we're looking at the the, the identity of a, of, of a local godhead uh, with the sense of uh, the religion, religious pantheon of the Romans in the Roman period, when we look at some, a site like Bath, where the Romans are coming along and say, oh, we'll put the local stuff in and we'll have the watery springs and we'll all have it as like one thing. Well, it just it'll work. Right. And in, in many ways, all, all the local people are doing that to the Romans, Pax. Um, Pax Britannia, which which I'm discussing in my new book, by the way, and and then what what we do see is you can see that this is this is more um, Pax picked, um, and nobody's getting the upper hand. Everyone's getting their upper hand in that. Everyone's happy, and this this in many ways is what religion should be about. It's it's. Um, uh, m m may, may I dare say it? It's it's a bit like, um, it, in some ways, it's a bit like Sahaldin looking at Jerusalem in the 1200s and saying, actually, you've you've got um, you, you've got these Christian places of worship in Jerusalem. We're going to capture Jerusalem. We're going to allow the Christian places of worship to continue, but the Christians are going to trade with us, and there's going to be an amalgam of culture. That is a tiny little metaphor, not similar to this, but. It's sort of a sense that sometimes, sometimes clashing ideas can really work. And, and that that's between in many ways, that's a man and a woman. Men and men are very different from women. And you get one you get um, uh, you get uh, the opposite sex together and it can really work. Um, and the end result, as with a coupling of people, the end result of the coupling of Christianity and, and the, the idea of the picks is what we're seeing in front of us. In, in many ways, in many ways, um, and, and, and again, look at that as beautiful carving, isn't it? Really, really pristine and, and, and really neat. Um, and obviously, you know, the you can you can you can make out two things that um, the Pictish stuff is older than the Christian stuff. So this is what was on the one side of the stone initially. And then on the other side of the stone, you've got the sense of new carving of the the christian way um and i'm just it makes me think it makes me think does it not that maybe there might have been a, a carving and uh, there might have been a carving on the side that the christian cross is being placed uh before the christian cross was placed on there but then again in most indications when we look at pictish stones it's either pictish carvings on one side and nothing on the other side so when christianity comes along they just turn the stone around and you just um put the carving on the christian carving on the one side and and the other side you forget maybe you might render over it and you like paint it white or something and and you leave it that's an idea Maybe, or maybe they just allowed the Pictish stuff to always show. But then again, when you've got Pictish and Christian together, um, why would you want to cover up the earlier stuff anyway? It doesn't make sense. This does, doesn't make sense at all. So, OK, m moving moving on a, 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 a bit more as well. So what we're going to do after the break, we're going to look at we're going to look at um, this site here um, near uh, near Aberdeen. It's a river that uh, uh, a river that a stone's been found in um and i'm gonna have to give some uh, water and some food to the chickens now uh because i think that's what they were moaning about um so that's what i'm gonna do i, I, I have to i'll have to apologize to the chickens instead of shouting and screaming at them uh -huh. um and um as you can probably work out i've had an ear bosh bashing off michelle who's off work for it for for this week um so anyway and it's goth's fault for telling me to sort the chickens out in the first place so we should take responsibility anyway so um what we're going to do we're going to find out if there are any questions talking about responsibility for things goth what would you like to say that's very very interesting that yeah i found that very interesting good thank you um, I, I, i'm glad i'm glad you approve next week next week by the way we haven't finished yet naturally but um 
I just want to make a uh, say a couple of things as well. Um, next week we're going to be looking at the kingdom of Mary, um, the king Zimri Lim, and the plague that hit his kingdom four thousand years ago. That's what we're doing next week. Um, I just Where's Mary. Mary, yes. Where is it? Ah, uh, you'll have to work that one out. Ooh. How do you spell it? <laughs> M A R I, Mary. Right. It's probably, it's probably, I haven't worked out the exact pronunciation. It's probably, it's probably not that at all. It's probably, uh, mur, mur, or something. <laughs> um, I'd just like to mention, so as I'm going around now, if anyone's interested in, uh, tomorrow at Lambledy, and they need to let me know as I'm going around now, if anyone wants to do the walk on Monday, they need to let me know as I'm going around now. And, um, obviously the Chester trip, let me know as I'm going around now. Um, and um, and Karen can make a decision on what she's doing with the room for next week. So first things first, um, um, Goff has probably answered if he's got anything to say. I know Goff couldn't be bothered to come on and work with me because he's too embarrassed to be seen with, out with me. So we'll forget Goff. So Algernon, what about you? Any questions or answers to any of that? I don't know. I'm anxiously waiting for part two. Don't be too an anxious. No, all right, then. Keith is always anxious. Anxious. Uh, Keith, what about any of that stuff I've mentioned? Interesting. Uh, anything? What's going on? The walk on Monday. Yeah, I'll be going. Coming on that. Yeah, Jim's picking me up. Uh, well, well, you know, Jim, you always organise these things with Jim. You know, it's just like... Yeah, he's a, he's a good taxi service. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I know. I, I would use and abuse him as well. Uh, I was going to ask, how far does Pictish um, uh, territory extend? Is it just a limited area of Scotland, or does it go further than that? Well, in 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 uh, six eight five, there was there was a, a major battle, uh, which which we will mention between the um, kingdom of Northumberland and the Picts. So you can imagine it's all going all the way down to Hadrian's Wall. So the idea the idea of well, well I'm, uh, you've actually got me in full flow again, which is really not a good idea. The the word the word Picti P I C T I Picti is a name given by the Romans to the people north of Hadrian's Wall. Right. Or north of the Antonine Wall. Right. It means painted people. Well, what we do find is that there's there's no context for the Picts um, um, wandering around naked on a battlefield, painting themselves with woad. What we might think is that the Picts, uh, what what we do feel maybe uh, is that the uh, the Romans were actually referring to the way that the Picts would paint their stones and the Picts would paint their metalwork and the Picts might have colourful clothing and the Picts might actually have coloured faces, uh, painted coloured faces. So the word Pict I is is a broad pantheon. It's the same. It's the same. It's the same way I I look at the word Druid. The Romans only mentioned the words Druid once when they they've got the campaign against the. Um, the, uh, the people of Anglesey. The word Druids is men mentioned once. And I think the word Druids is actually a, an overall umbrella name uh, that the Romans use for any any people that might be resisting them and might be involved in strange acts of religious worship. It's not actually a set word. So I don't think the word Picts is a set, wor set word. When people go looking for the Picts, they, they find something very, very different. Um, and that's a very important point. Okay. Uh, Beautiful Jane, wonderful Jane, curvaceous Jane. Um, oh, those words were all in the right vein. Vein, Jane. Sorry, Jane. Anything you'd like to say? Uh, Jim, no, just that I, I like it that um, you've got the Pictish stuff on the one side and the Christian stuff on the other side. They look great. It's good history, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is actually. You know, I did these post-its for um, um, when 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 I did the live thing with Mike. I said stones with no carvings on them could be from any period. They've always been there, maybe a thousand years. Um, and then you come along with the picks with these nice little bits of um, carvings on them, the, the 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 double circles and the triple circles, and the blacksmith's um, tools. And then you get for late 500, 600, you get like Christian symbolism, and it's still continued, but they've they've done it on the other side, and they they've kept this stuff on the other side of the stone. And then you've got the Christian stuff, and then cheekily, if it's a new Christian stone, which is really class two, which has been well dressed and well smoothed and all the rest of it, what you do find is around the back they cheekily put some stuff on there again it's it's they they they, they and, and they get away with it actually it's the same thing as well jane when you look at for example christian sites you have the green man in the medieval period you golf suddenly disappeared um you you have the sense of the green man and you think of the green man as being like a pagan like symbol 
and you see gargoyles on Christian works and you're thinking, why is that? And it's, the, it's because some of the much older ways have actually come in. Um, and if and you've got like Hearn the Hunter and all the rest of it, that's not Christian, that, that's old stuff. But that's still sort of embodied and imbued on, on the Christian stuff that's actually coming through. Right, um, Chris, anything you'd like to say, babe? No, very interesting, thank you. Are we seeing you and um, Lynn on Monday, darling? No, no. Okay, okay. Right, um, and finally, before I have my little break, right, Michelle? All right, then. Uh, before, before, before we have our, our little break, um, oh, I forgot the numpties. Any, any answers to any of those questions? Come on, I want my break. You got loads of questions to answer. You want to go? I mean, I need to use the ladies' room. Quick, quick. Oh, uh, oh, one question, Carl. Yeah. What, what sort of date? When I was in Scotland, there was a lot of crosses in the churches with like a, um, a, a circle around a cross with designs and that. So is that later or earlier? Much later. Much, much later period. Thank you. And you may have the pleasure of mine and Kathy's company on Monday as well. And oh, right. it, it, it's cancelled. We'll change the location. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now we will be seeing something that we don't usually get to see on that walk, so that's what we're going to be doing on Monday. So, if you have anything, a, anything else you'd like to say before we have yes. a break? Have, have we got a picture of the Brock of Bursay one? Um, what what I'm going to do? There's 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 two things I'm going to do in the break. So, uh, I, I will I will we do have an image of the Brock of Bursay, but not a good one. So I'll see if I can get that. Okay, we, we will show that one um any anything else anyone wants to say before we go no kathy you come into chester with us darling all oh, right she's she's muted the bloody thing right on on, on that note right i'm gonna i'm gonna take a break so okay. uh, break it in we'll take we'll take a break there we go um... And... Wow! Wow! Do you know? Do, 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 uh, uh, listen, listen, listen to this, right? We, we, we'll uh, again because you're so obsessed with her. We'll uh, you we're going to pause the recording. It's amazing, isn't it? It's just like it makes you think you're in old California. <laughs> oh bless her, little chickadee! Little <laughs> chickadee, little chickadee. Right, okay, so. Before the before the break and in the break, I was getting very animate and um, Kathy asked me about the well, somebody asked about well, I mentioned about the rune rune, uh, the Ogham script on them on the stones. Uh, and then we got the breath of Berze stone, which I've which I've managed to um, get a couple of images of. And we, we shall we shall look at that at the end. So I need to really go to the image that we left off with. That's where we're going to go. And we're, hang on a minute. So uh, it would help if I got rid of that and I got rid of that. And then I did that. And then I did this. Nobody knows what I'm doing or what I'm talking no, about. No, no. Right. No, no, no. There's a song there. Please don't go, babe. I love you so. And nobody, nobody said that they couldn't see me either. That was an advantage. You've gone all together now. Well, there you are. Back again with a map. Swonk. So I think that what I've been leading towards is that there are these Pictish stones, many more are being found year in, year out. And what we what we do understand is that in regards to the landscape of Scotland is there's obviously much more out there to find. And in regards to my own interest of those missing Roman forts and other Roman sites around Scotland, well, if you can not find a Pictish hill fort with really clear banks and ditches and until like last year, I'm sure you can find a little Roman marching camp somewhere in the outback there. So 
I'm sure that these little stones, and they are little if they're, you know, two meter tall things, they're little compared with whole sites. Um, but, but again, they're massively intriguing. A, a stone found in the River Don. And there she is. Now, we, we obviously find them in church graveyards. We find them in uh, building development sites. We find them on archaeological sites. We, we find them in the river like this. So what you can see is some faint designs on here. You can actually find the typical uh, circles and you can find the mirror design there. And you've got a nice sort of uh, rectilinear shape. Again, this being found in a river and just a little bit of a story about that. And then what I would like to do is go into a little bit of colour and then we're going to puddle off to Orkney. And actually, the image that I've got in front of me on this slide is far, far more clearer than the one I'm actually showing on the screen. So I'm actually going to um, I'm actually going to show this as well. So hang on a minute. Let's just uh, show this other image. Um, you can see this a lot more clearly, this one. There you go. You can see the design a lot more clearly. This is actually the article that was printed in the newspaper. Now, this Pictish symbol stone discovered in Aberdeen in the river, discovered in August 2018. The Pictish stone carved with mysterious symbols has been discovered in the River Don as river levels drop this summer. Why it was in the river, what that indicates, it was probably, it was on, on the land at one point and, and the River Don has um, <coughs> eroded and it's it's sort of been eroded into the river. Or there could be another meaning that it may have actually been chucked into the river. So resultant sustained spell of a dry and warm river revealing the stone. The survey and removal of the stone. Amazing enough, these, the, they're finding sort of one of these a year. And the Scots are really massively interested into recovering these stones and putting them in safe places. As we mentioned earlier on, class one pictures, symbol stone, where it's still slightly rough. There's sort of earlier symbols on there. And teams of experts from um, um, Scottish Heritage, Historical uh, Scotland, as, as it's known now, and Aberdeen Council, the University of Aberdeen, all coming together to get their funding together to actually take this out the river. And again, in 2018, as it's still a very exciting find today, we're very excited by this find, made all the more remarkable by, by the brief window of opportunity we had to recover the stone before the water levels rose again. So, so when you see these stones, in regards to the ones in Orkney as well, when you see them, you've got to get into them and you've got to recover them as soon as possible. So they've got emergency contractors in there, safely remove the stone from the river. And as we actually get to the images themselves, as we as we move to the image that I had then on the screen and we go to there and we move. Obviously, m moving this one and a half ton boulder out, out of the river is very, very important so they can actually sort of um, understand this as an important piece of the culture of Scotland. This stone itself, like um, the, the the first one that we looked at, um, and obviously lots of the symbolism, which we see dates probably from about the 500s, and are typically um, class one stones, as I mentioned earlier on, are, are not as dressed as the later ones with Christian symbolism on, really unworked on the surfaces with carved symbols. And the meaning of these symbols is hotly debated, but they, but we do think that the meaning of, of what we do see, the symbolism on in these stones, represents uh, in individuals or groups. And as this stone, like lots of the other stones, is to be displayed um, in a local museum. Pictures, symbol stones, probably the Aberdeen Museum, are incredibly rare. And this one, with its apparent connection to the river, adds further to the discussions around their meaning and what they were used for. You would think that we'd have an idea by now about the distinctive set of symbols carved into these stones and what they, what they mean, but they obviously clearly identify uh, with the Pictish tradition. We've, we've got 50 really complete ones spread across um, uh, Scotland and at least 200 odd more that have other symbols associated with the Pictish period elsewhere and smaller ones again on top of that lip, uh, list. So we've got quite a, quite a corpus of work and each of these is a significant uh, indicator of the Pictish world that isn't a dark world at all. If you've got you know, hundreds of these things with different carvings on them. It's not a dark world at all. It's quite illuminated. And we'll, we'll, we'll get an idea of the, the fascinating sense of illumination that we're going to look at with the next images now coming up. 
So that, that stone besides, let's sort of move on a little bit and look at how we believe that some of these stones may have actually been portrayed. Now, Kathy has actually seen this one because I do believe that this one is in the basement um, of the Inverness County Council. So Scotland's carved Pictish stones re-emerge in colour. Now this one itself, you can see you can see that if you I, I don't know if you've already been thinking like me that the, the carvings that you've been seeing seeing are really powerful symbols, but when when you when you think about these symbols again and you put colour on them, they even become more powerful. Now, trying to understand whether they add colour on these stones is down to modern science. And we're starting to get to the level that we might be able to trace some of the ochre, some of the um, natural organic substances actually used on these stones. And the other thing as well is we can actually understand from these stones other surface, uh, other uh, carvings that don't readily appear on the surface. So what we're talking about is that by um, every time somebody has um, gone into one of these stones with a chisel, um, th that that's produced um, that's produced stress fractures in the rock, fine, minute stress fractures in the rock. So when the carving, like something clearly defined like this, is created, when that starts to fade and you can no longer see it in the rock deep below the surface, you can actually still indicate you have using fine um, microscopes to actually see those stress fractures. Um, and just, just to sort of interjection, the Elysig Pillar, which is the uh, title um, of our publication, which we send out to our members, as, as you all are, um, the Elysig Pillar is a stone that you can't see any of the original carvings on it anymore, except using um, a, a spectrography um, microscopes um, on that type of stone and these stones where you can't see the designs anymore, you can actually um, still read what was once there and you get and start to get the signs to understand the colour as well. And when you add colour to these things, actually the imbued meaning changes again, because maybe uh, some people's ideas of boars with one community being red boars might actually be green boars with another community, the green or the blue might be telling you something else or the, or the, or the red or the yellow or, or whatever colour you're using. Um, and as you can see, you squint on the left, that's really powerful. You squint on the right, and it takes a different meaning altogether. Um, and again, if you're talking about emblems and you're talking about representations of families and groups and, and leaders, and each of these each of these symbols may be representing a chieftain, adding colour is a is a bit the same as if you add colour to coats of arms. So on some coats of arms, they might represent um, <laughs> um, a lion, might be a red lion. On other coats of arms, you might see a yellow lion or a green lion. It, color, is, color is as important as the carvings themselves um, and the imbued meaning associated with the carvings. Now, this, this stone is known as the Knock Nagel Boar Stone. Um, and archaeologists have mm. been uncovering ornate decorated picture stones across northern Scotland for many years. But I think what we're now starting to see is that the ones that are new, new to archaeology, we're taking a little bit more care with them. And the reason why we're taking a little bit more care with them, if you, as they come out of the ground, if you wash them off and you, you remove all those layers of grime and dirt, you might actually be removing not only some of the pigments um, associated <laughs> with the colours that we use on the stones, some of them might be whitewashed, you know, wow, how powerful would that be? You imagine one whitewashed stone, for example, this, um, any light shining onto the whitewashed stone, um, you, would, you would have shadows formed and that would give a 3D effect to the stone, even if the stones were actually whitewashed. Michelle was talking about this with me yesterday, she, we, we, we were talking about the, the idea that with the in, in, incision marks made into the stone, by the stone mason, maybe you might actually find flecks of some of the iron embedding into the stone itself. So if you wash these stones readily, you get rid of all that evidence. So it's talking about using fine microscopes to actually find the evidence 
on these stones with magnification far in excess of anything that you'd use in a school um, classroom. And one thing that I'd actually like to mention, one thing that I've actually completely missed earlier on, you know, I, you know, I was talking about um, a stone being erect with wonderful Pictish carvings on, and then, then there wasn't enough of that in the ground to actually keep it upright, they collapsed, right? And then it was re-erected and then it fell down. And then the example that, that we've um, seen um, in, re in regards to the, the Black Isle Stone itself, the Dingwall Stone itself, when, when, when we mentioned that, um, I, one thing that I completely failed to mention is, is that that stone must have been flat before they put the inscription of 1796 on it um, in regards to Q. You could only carve um, you can only properly carve into a stone when it's laying flat. It's really difficult to carve into the stone when it's upright. And if you're carving into a stone when it's upright and it's got really poor foundations, the, th the whole thing's going to fall over. <coughs> and you can put more pressure onto a stone and put more detail into it if the stone is laying flat. So, you know, this is a really important point. You would argue that you can carve into a stone if it's upright. But you're not going to be able to put those fine details into it. I know full well that, you know, you've got a family gravestone and, you know, but usually they take those gravestones away to be reinscribed because that's the way stone masons do it to get right, try and get the detail. It's a really very important point there. So understanding the animals and the symbols are impressive, but adding colour to these vivid colours to the salmon, the ravens, the wolves, the people, the battle scenes and all the rest of it. Um, Adding colour to it is, is a lot more powerful, you know, and, you know, we, we, we've got to continue on and, and, and understand archaeology, but understand archaeology from from a from from a new a new way of understanding archaeology, taking much more care with the archaeology. And I think much more is being made of the idea of patina when, when you get over time. The, the, the little grooves, the little incisions on the stones, the, the, a patina builds up and by reading that patina, you can get an idea of the date of the stone and the wear and all the rest of it, all these wonderful things going on. So adding colour is, is, is a sense of interpretation and, and lots of the idea of adding colour is, is, is very much to do with this whole theory and principle that, that you have um, whenever you look at other, um, whenever you look at these panels it, and, and you look at the idea of adding colour to them, it, it, it's, a, it's going back to that sense that the Pictish ironwork has a lot of colour associated with it. Um, um, the, you know, the pottery and everything else has a lot of colour added to it. And, and obviously, again, many ac academics agree the Picts were descended from, uh, from Indigenous people and the, and the Romans described the Picti, Pict the nickname the Romans used to describe communities north of Hadrian's Wall, or I'm using the word pick die as being the painted people, and you would see lots of academics referring to the picks as the painted people. But maybe um, um, when you use a name in Latin, like ratus ratus, which is the common rat, or you might use the word um, uh, the atrobati, the atrobati people, yeah, whatever atrobati means. Um, it, it, it's 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 akin to a people rather than um, imbued with a meaning or am I completely wrong there but but um looking looking at this stone as well this stone itself look at the power of this stone you add color to it and it and it, it, it takes another meaning uh and it tells you something else now there's an important point I want to make, um, and it's a point that I hope everybody will understand when I say it. People's skin colour. If you've got two people in a room, you've got a person with white skin and people with black skin in a room, and you add a third person and you blindfolded that third person. Right? Hang on a minute, who's interrupting there? I was making an important point and somebody interrupted. Well, we lost you. Oh, okay, okay, right, okay. Cut, cut, cut your mic, because I cut your mic because I was making an important point. Oh. Please, thank you. Oh God. Sometimes you get some real muppets, don't you, God? 
Nice to have you back, Andrea. So the point I was trying to make, if you get a person with white skin in a room and black skin in a room, um, and you've got somebody else in a room and, and you everyone's blindfolded, the white and the black person is, uh, they're both humans. They're, 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 they're both the same person, right? Um, and you, you, you might, you have the same sense and feeling for both of them, right? And, and there's, everything's fine. Everything's fine. You take the blindfold off and the one person might now interpret the white person as being one type of person and the black person being another type of person. Um, and this is the same to be said with these stones. When you add color to these stones, they take on a different meaning, right? They take on a, a I, I, I'm, I'm, I've got to try and do, they, we're getting too much background a minute. I, I'm, I'm trying to get into a flow. Whoever's coming and going, can you, whenever you come back, just put your mic off. Right, thank you. So, oh, God, hang on a minute. I'm, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop the share now and I'm going to mute people. Thank you. And let's go through the list because I'm, I'm trying to make some important points and I'm getting interrupted. Okay, that's fine. Let's go on back to it. I've got to be firm with this, haven't I, Goff? Certainly have. Let me know. I tell you what. You've got, and it's, it's the women who are causing problems today. You've got to be firm with them. You've got to put them in their place and you've got to be firm with them. It's always the women. I tried to do that with Michelle and she threw me out. <laughs> the little ones are the worst. Oh, God, she is the feisty little red-headed witch. So, okay, try, let's try and get to my flow. Now, again, I was making that analogy, that, that metaphor. You, you you change the inscribed stones from just being inscribed stones, you add colour to them, and they've got a completely different meaning. However, like those two people in a room, like the white person and, and the uh, um, black coloured uh, person in the room, um, do they need to be anything different? Do they, they do they need to have a different meaning? So so all of these are really complex areas, but in this case, you see that there's something else going on. The 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 sense of colour with the stone makes the stones look three D, and it projects a lot more. There's a there's a, a deeper message with the stone coming through when you add colour to it. Up until adding the colour to it. Um, you might you're not really seeing what's going on. It's a bit like the Bayer Bayer tapestry in black and white. It's not really going to have the same meaning. But again, you add a bit of colour to it, and the meaning changes, or it it's got a heightened meaning and a an heightened interpretation. Now, this 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 stone this stone is a very very powerful stone. Now this this stone is associated with an event this is the known as the abel lemno stone um, and this this stone itself might be associated with the battle of dun nectane that occurred in 685 a.d now this is the Ar Arblemno stone in angus in scotland now you look at this and and what you do see is that there's two groups of people on it now, you've got the one group of people on the left, and the Picts defeated the people of Northumberland. So, in other words, the Picts have got to be the people on the left. Yeah, and the no, the people of Northumberland are the ones on the right. Now, the Picts are inevitably fending off the people from Northumberland, and the Picts, this Pictish rider there, is chasing after a Northumberland rider who has dismissed his sword and has dismissed his shield. So the Northumberland rider is running away. Um, a Northumberland rider um, is attacking the Pictish foot soldiers, but the Pictish foot soldiers are holding their own. I think what's interesting at the bottom, you have another Pictish rider um, being attacked by a Northumberland rider, but this Northumberland um, a soldier that's running away is now being stopped from running away because the raven's in there. Now, the raven is a very important symbol um, within many um, interpretations of culture within Great Britain. And you can naturally see what I'm trying to say, that adding colour is very important. Also, if you look towards the top of the stone, if we sort of move um, to the top of the stone, you've got this wonderful um, rectilinear um, object here. 
You've got the mirror uh, with the two eyes either side. You've got the um, you've got the Z rod, which is there. You've got all the other interpretation. And in a way, this is this is old Pictish symbolism coming in to assist um, with imbuing meaning on this carving, which must have been done after the battle in two, eight, but in 685 into 685. And also, you know, the point I made earlier on as well, that you've got um, over two thirds of the stone are, would have been above ground level. In fact, um, four fifths of the stone is above ground level. And naturally that stone over time, unless it's really fastened into the ground, is going to fall over. And why that is, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe the Pictish carver said, "Look, you know what we're going to do, boys and girls. Um, we're just, we're just going to make the best use of this stone. I don't, you know, it's going to stand for a few years. That's fine. We don't really care. Um, and we're just, they love, they love their carving. You can, you can see how intricate this is. And in, 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 in some ways, more than most, we've got." I, I don't know if this is going to be the right thing to say. There are as many Pictish stones just slightly after the period of the Romans in England um, and the rest of Britain uh, than actually Rome, Rome, Roman period carved stones. We've, we've got lots um, for, for a people that the Romans would refer to as the Picti. Um, what, what we do feel is that there's a lot more going on. And obviously, obviously over time, over time, what you do see as with this um and you can see that more of this stone would have been in the ground okay this this is the first stone that we looked at in elgin from the other side and what you can see on this side you've got this wonderful mirror they say it's a mirror in a case right it's it's oh, okay it's a mirror and a case um and you you've got this uh, you've got the z rod again and on, on but the both sides of this are, uh, are inscribed um some don't have inscriptions on the other side as i mentioned this one has inscriptions on both sides large chunk of this in the ground as well which is rather different from all the others and look at that there Whew. now this is this is that sort of this is that type of stone i was talking about you know that that sort of what was it talking about um one two i'm gonna go back to my notes the, the um hang on a minute we've got the first type and scribe we've got the scribe right Oh yeah, this this is this is going to be that that third type of stone, isn't it? Where where you've got sort of a sense of mythical beasts, and you've got um, a sense of the the Pictish world, and then you've got this beautiful Christian cross. This is going to be a, probably a little bit more later. I think this is about like like dating from about the nine hundreds when when most of the Pictish um, iconography has gone, but it's clearly that the Pictish iconography is still there, and obviously you've got. You've got mixtures of the scroll work and you've got the rectilinear um, knot work on there, which is very Book of Cows there, much, much later cross, but it's it rather, rather powerful what you see. Again, you add colour to it, everything changes. You can see more when you add colour to it as well, because when you add colour to it, yeah, if you can't get those details of eyes, you can put the detail of the eyes in there a bit more. You can paint the detail of the eye on there rather than relying upon the, the, the craft of the carver, which is, again, a really important point. Um, and again, I, just just like the idea of just completely whitewashing one of these stones um, and then just sort of allowing the sun to make contrast of all the incisions and stuff. But over year, over the years, as in my notes, the um obviously if these are stood out in the outside for a thousand years the pigment has all been washed away and the and the and, and the and the mineralized um, ochre has all been washed away and so on but obviously we we do know that that you know coloration is massively important to the pics and this the the another point to a sort of bit of a um bit of a little sort of a gem really uh, we're not talking about this this level of art being seen just in the Pictish world above Hadrian's Wall, you're actually seeing that you do have this type of stonework in Northumberland. Not the same as this, but sim similar types of stonework in Northumberland and Mercia, which is much further south, the Chester area. And then, then what you also see is, is you get the idea of the Book of Kells and, and you, you've, got, you've got the idea of of the book of Duro, um, and you've got the the hogback carvings that you see associated with Cumbria as well. So you know it's almost as if there, there's a big school of sort of competing stone craftsmanship within that area. You've got stone 
carvings in Wales, but they're predominantly in regards to the, the, the Christian wrong word pantheon of interpretation. And then you get that in Cymru, Wales, and you get that in Cornwall. But what you do see in England, in the rest of England, you don't see much of this carving, not massively at this level. There is stuff, but they're not massively at this level. So this so is this a periphery world, this old British world. You've got all this carving. And a pix could be could be said to be the ancestors to most people in Scotland, but you've got the Scottish tribe going over to Scotland, which, which I know given the name Scotland. But obviously this influence continues in much later carvings that you would see with the islands in regards to uh, the likes of Kirkwall Cathedral and so on. So the added to um, added to this, the this this is of massive significant cultural um, influence throughout the ages, um, and and this this expert is saying that what what we do feel um, is that it, the hypothesis to say that all these stones were painted is is more than a hypothesis it it's a it's a strong it, it's a strong um academic idea um and lots more is being made of these stones being painted and why not have these stones painted i think i think it's only a matter of time before we find a stone and we actually find that it's so full of ochre and colorant um that this theory is to be proven completely and utterly correct um, and we, we've got this. We've got this little image on on the screen. It, it's what what we do see as well. One thing that I've completely missed out from this is that we, we've got that um, Ogham script along there. So even where we've got these designs within the image there, if you want to quickly read that text, we've got those designs quickly on the image there. Um, and we've got Ogham being used. So I think it's only a matter of time before we can understand the imagery alongside the Ogham script to yeah. really untrap, uh, un untap this code and sort of really help us. It says here, Pictish pictures, the symbols here include the so-called Pictish beast on the right there, uh, which might represent a legendary aquatic creature like a Kelpie know them well their meaning now lost the motives could record an individual's name or status mark land ownership or um, display tribal allegiance a sophisticated pictish society that developed this system of symbols laid the foundations of the medieval kingdoms of scotland so so what we do find with 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 this power and um, and then maybe the skills were then taken over to build the great cathedrals of elgin um, and the great building schemes in, in Edinburgh and other locations in Scotland over the many, many years. I, 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 do, I do love this. I do like this one here very much. And, and what, 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 what we're seeing with this one, this, this is known as the Dunfalandi stone. Uh, this is in, in the deep highlands of, of, of Persia in Scotland. Now, with, we... Um, if we hang on a minute, oh god, I've just I've just lost my. Uh, we got that image there, right? That's what I need. So, we what we see on this is 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 something really interesting. We without the Ogham script on it, um, we've got the Christian symbolism, and it, it's beautifully garishly coloured there. Um, and in regard, it's almost as if the Pictish symbolism. Coming into the nine ten hundreds, the um, the the Pictish um, symbolism has gone over to um, the 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 Lamb of the Lamb of Christ and you Lamb of God, and then you've got the angels on the right, um, and you've got a deer, um, and you've got some other beasts, and it's like thinking, right, you know, we've got to tone down the Pictish stuff. Let's get rid of the uh, the symbols now. Um, but then again, in the cross itself, you've got all these little pellets, these little red things. A sort of um, hark back to the old Pic Pictish way of carving on these stones, and then then on the then on the reverse of the stone, depending which is the obverse and which is the reverse and so on, which is the front and which is the back. Um, this is obviously being carved um, at the same time, maybe, or maybe by two different craftsmen, but it's it's sort of more or less contemporary. 
um, and you've got you've got this this wonderful um, priestly figure on the horse, and you've got this really fat monk there on the left, and you've got an abbot on the right, and you've got this nice little cross, um, and and then then you get completely lost, and you think, well, you've got a two serpents left and the right, flanking and and um, flanking the panel in the middle, and then then the um, the stonemason has gone nuts. He's decided to put this beast on there. Um, he's put dis decided to put the double disc on there. He's supposed to put the crescent moan and the V rod rather than the Z rod. And you've got another beast on the right here. You've got the um, V rod and the, and the uh, crescent moon. And you've got the blacksmith's anvil and the blacksmith's hammer. And you've got the blacksmith's tongs. And you think it, I think this guy actually went nuts on the, a Wednesday afternoon. I thought, oh, sorry, so I've done the Christian stuff on the other side. If it's the same person. And I've decided to put this on the back. And you see this without you see this in in Christianity throughout the medieval period, they they, they do really well with the artwork and then they put the bloody gargoyles up there and they put little devils in places and you're thinking should this be at home on any Christian locality because it's harp, harping back to the old idea of the green man and, and her and the hunter and all the rest of it and bring it back in to the Christian world it's it's a little bit of a fad a little bit of an interest a bit a bit of a signature of your skill because to be honest with you. Not really skillful if you're creating a, a cross on the left there. You've got to put some other stuff on there, you know. That's your mark. And this is um, this itself is is portraying again what you can see there is some nice nice Ogham script. And again, you've got the serpents. This is a rough stone class class one. Um, mm. Why you've got the imagery coming in? This is when. Ogham's script is still sort of new in about the late 400s, 500s, and 600s. It's great, you know, people love it. And the, there's one difference between the the Ogham script in regards to in in regards. Oh, Jane's got to go. Um, Jane, I'm going to read out your statements. Thanks, very interesting session. Love the colours on the covers. Jane, I'll see you next week. It's great to have you. Yeah, Jane. Uh, I know it's getting a bit late, so um, thank you for that, Jane. Um, see you next week, Jane. And. Just, just like to mention as well, you, 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 the, diff, the 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 Algam script in 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 Scotland is 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 probably the same is probably the same um, meaning in, of, of each of the symbols. They might be slightly different, but sim, similar um, similar way of looking at this. But instead of being on the side wrapped on the side of the stone. In lots of cases, it's wrapped on the face. So you've got like, um, you know, this 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 stone is about so and so, and and obviously the symbolism is about so and so. And we've got some nice painting on on here, which is now gone. Um, and so so we've we've got that little sense there. And then what I'd like to do then is that this one on Berze. Now this 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 I do believe, and I, I I've got the. Um, that's it in the museum. Nice little warriors with square shields, my dearie me. Um, and this is the stone on display at Berze. Now you've got to have a really good day to actually see the the replica stone on Berze. But you've got these these sort of three warriors at the bottom. Um, and this is at the very intriguing Berze site on Orkney. And, and what, what I'm going to do, I know some of you need to go and whatever, so I'm just going to keep it really really brief. Um, and I'll just read out this statement here. Um, if there is one item that has come to typify the picks in Scotland, it must surely be the numerous ornately carved um, symbol stones they left behind. No one really knows with any degree of the certainty why these enigmatic stones were erected or the significance of the symbols carved on them. But as with all things Pictish, there are theories aplenty. Bingo. Some scholars have claimed that they were territorial markers, others that the stones commemorate great events or um, great people or events. Let's go with all of it. It has also been suggested that symbols may denote the rank of an individual within the community, perhaps recorded marriage treaties or were a means of representing personal Pictish names or um, the, somebody may have just done it for the <laughs> for the sake of it, you know. Uh, but um, but again, this 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 one at the Brock of Bursay, where, where I'm just going to end, so we're, we're going to end today. Uh, this symbol, uh, symbol stone fragments, ex this was actually excavated in 1935, so it'd been in the ground since, you know, until 1935. Uh, replica now stands on the site, and the original, um, the original fragments are in the National Museum of Ed Edinburgh. Oh my god, I actually thought they were in an Orkney Museum, they're in Edinburgh, that's a bit strange. Um, anyway, what we do find on this is, is that 
you know, we, 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 we've got um, the three warriors, we've got the eagle, we've got the beast, we've got the, um, we've got the mirror case, we've got the, the V-Rod and the Crescent. Um, and, and again, um, it's great to have actually replicas like this on, on, on site, somewhere like Berze. But I tell you what, the replicas never ever last that long, to be honest with you. They, 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 always, quickly, they always quickly erode. Um, a bit like the stone that's um, on display, display in connection with the land grant in, in the, uh, at the Castle of Ogmore that, that was erected in about the 1940s, 50s, the originals in the National Museum of Wales. Can't read it anymore. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this, this one you can still read, uh, see a little bit on there, but um, unfortunately um, it is eroding away, so they might actually put a, have to put a new replica of the replica on there. Um, and that's the one in the uh, uh, Edinburgh Museum, and just sort of look at that again. And again, when we think about it, just just I think the quick point to be made is that where you where you see the Pictish world, they love their symbols and they're similar from community to community. Similar as the word, there might be slight um, intricate di differences. Um, it's a bit like um, um, it's a bit like learning the Welsh language. Redhi, Redhni, and Redhui, and all the rest of it, and and each of them has a, a slight different meaning, and it, it's sort of um, go, going into that and. And each of these eagles from a different point, part of Scotland may have a different meaning, a beast being having something else again, and the colour adding uh, a different angle to it as well. Um, and on that note, I think there's a good place to finish today. A wonderful, wonderful look at this today. Um, into deep territory next week, where I, I've never looked at the, this kingdom next week that we're looking at, which has existed for. Um, which they had a plague 4,000 years ago. Very topical. Right, are there any questions, folks? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've got warriors on the stones. We've got beasts on stones. We've got tools on stones and crosses. Have we got any women? Um, I'm going to go deep into my deep animals. I, I, I'm thinking the answer is going to be yes, but there's not many representations of women. Yeah, it's inter interesting in itself. Very interesting in itself. Um, now, it 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 was it was a bit like that lecture last week with the Mountche people. The, the Mountche people really respected their women, um, but you don't see as many representations as women in regards to the Mountche people as we saw within their art last week. Um, and in many ways, you can say that with Viking civilization as well. But the, in Viking civilization, the women had the upper hand. They were the ones who wore the trousers. And Goff would know all about that. Um, <laughs> Goff had a, 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 had a thing with a Viking woman once, and he, he, he never looked back. He did look only back. Only once. And, only once, yeah. Oh, once is never enough. That's, what, that's his regret in life. Um, uh, 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 Hammond Lehman, that's where it was. Right, okay. Um, uh, Algernon, anything you'd like to say? Oh, no, uh, very interesting. Very interesting. I, I got, I got you saying it's very interesting. I, I really appreciate your your praise. Um, what about what about you? What about you, what about you, Numpty Keith? Anything else? No, 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 no. I'm just going to say it's all rubbish. Rubbish to you as well, you nunk. Um, anyway, Chris. Yeah, it was very interesting. Thanks, Carl. Okay, my pleasure. Um, let's do uh, let's do Goff. Anything you'd like to say, Goff? Yeah. Any of these stones in the north of Ireland or the Isle of Man? No, not not that I'm aware of at all. I, I know. I thought the Pict sort of went over to Northern Ireland. Well, this is that great debate now. Um, right. it, it's, it's that hotly debated thing. Um, are are the are the people of Scotland today Picts or are they um, Scots or are they both? Um, it's all back to that old um, that old tribal argument between um, um, you know was it Rangers and, and Celtic and so on and it's just like yeah it goes way back all that yeah. So I, I can't I don't I, I think the answer is no but you, you've got a very good point there. Um, right, let's find out if there's anything anyone would like to say from the. Um, uh, uh, the knob rot gang. Well, it was an absolutely wonderful lecture, Carl. One of the most interesting we've had for absolutely ages. Thank you so much. But can you please repeat the bit we missed? <laughs> <laughs> How am I going to repeat the bit you missed? Well, we missed a good ten minutes of it. I tell you what. 
I, I tell you what, this is recorded, right? And I and I can't really work out the bit bit I missed. Now, what I'm going to do, what I could do, right, is is I I could um, I don't know how I would do that. I don't know I don't know where we missed, but this has been recorded. So what I think I'm going to do. Don't know either because we missed it, so we don't know what we missed. I I tell you, you know the best thing to do is what I will do. I will put the record. I will get the recording straight up online, right? Um, and then. Um, if you guys turn up at Karen's house earlier next week, you can you can watch the bit you missed. Is that a fair deal? Oh, that would be very helpful. Thank you. I, I, I will do that. And I will. I've written that into my diary now to get that link directly over to you, Karen, as soon as I've finished. And actually, if you if you hang around there long enough for like 15 minutes, it would be online anyway. It's up to you guys. Right. Uh, before, be, anyway, before you go, anything that you guys would like to um, ask Karen or Andrea? I don't even know if Andrea was with you. Um, was no. Andrea? No, Andrea wasn't with question. you today. All right. Anything you'd like to say? Anybody got anything no. to say? No. Oh, oh, ask him if we're oh, going, going up to the cars on Monday. Oh yeah. Where are we parking on Monday? Where are we meeting? You're, you're parking by the church, and I and I and I and obvious, obviously we're not going to the castle. Why? What? No, yeah, obviously we are. You promised me. Hang on. Obviously, we're not no, going to the castle. Yes, we're not going. Yes, we're not obviously. going to the castle. We're, no, we're, we're, so clearly we're not going. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> We've got no permission to be at the castle at all, so we're not going to go to the castle. I was going to religiously stick to the fact <laughs> it's not allowed <laughs> and speak really quietly, so nobody knows we're there. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. That'll be a first. That'll be a, there's a story about that. It is a story. Um, and I do believe Jess, is there anything you want to say? Oh no, it's all right. No, it's, yeah, it's, all right. It's, it's 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 my pleasure. Okay, what I'll do, I'll get this recording out. And and this has been an absolute delight today. So I'm looking forward to seeing you some of you on Monday with with eggs. Um anyone want to join us tomorrow night? We'll out Lamb Bledy and Castle at 7 30. But um if um if there's no other questions, um, thanks for your continued support with everything. It's really appreciated. Um, and, oh, you know, that was a massive glowing endorsement from Kathy this week. I think she's after something, God. But, you know. After your body again. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I'm, I'm, who, who can blame them? You know, <laughs> Goff and Alan know all about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> on, on that note, um, I'm gonna. If no other questions, and if anyone wants to stay around at the end, that's fine. I'll, I'll I'll answer that. But if not, I'll see you all next week. So good goodbye, Algernon, uh, Keith, Chris, bye. Bye. Off, bye, everybody, uh, bye. Karen, Andrea, Jim, bye. the Numpty, bye. and bye. Kathy. Love you all. Bye. 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 Uh, and, and and Jessica and Ellen. Goodbye, bye. Ellen. I'll see you soon. You know, we 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 love our Ellen. She bye. hasn't said anything. Bye bye, Ellen. Right. Okay. So I think that's uh, that's everyone. It's only it's only Ellen and um, Jessica left. So anyway, thanks for watching us today. I, I've got to get this online as soon as possible, as promised. Thank you.